this year, there's a fair chance it featured three exotic figures from the East bearing gifts. The wise men are an essential part of the traditional Christmas. I know that I belted out we three kings of Orient are after a couple of glasses of mulled wine. But who were they? Where did they come from? What was this star that they saw in the night sky? The visit of the Magi, as Matthew calls them, is celebrated next week in the Western Church in recognition that they probably arrived sometime after the birth of Jesus. But how can we be sure? Is there any evidence that they ever existed? And what does the story mean for us today? Joining me to discuss the Magi are the Reverend Dr. Steve Jeffrey, Minister of Emmanuel Evangelical Church in Southgate in London, Claire Foster Gilbert, Chief Executive of the Ethics Academy, and Dr. Mark Kidger, an astronomer from the European Space Agency in Madrid and the author of The Star of Bethlehem. Steve, is the story true? Did the wise men visit the baby Jesus? Yeah, the story is true. It's fashionable in some circles and has been for a a few decades to deny the truth of the Bible on the grounds that it's a religious document. But of course, the plain fact is that almost everything is ideologically motivated in some way and that doesn't mean it's not truthful. And so increasingly, people who take the Bible with any degree of seriousness are realising that history and ideology go hand in hand. And God is the great storyteller. He orchestrates the whole of human history to tell the story that he has in his mind. So yes... The story of the Magi visiting the infant Jesus is true. Claire, would you define it as a myth or historical truth, or is there any contradiction between those two? I suppose there could be a contradiction, but I I wouldn't say there is one, and I think it's a great compliment to call a story a myth, because myths define us. The stories that societies tell themselves define those societies and help those societies to be what they are, and this is a very, very great story. I rather believe it is true actually it's a very sparse story as we're given in Matthew I see no reason not to believe it it's been wondrously built on in the centuries that have followed in some ways I think quite plausibly in other ways not but the basic story I see no reason to disagree with Mark where's the astronomical evidence I I gather the Chinese saw something in the skies around about 5 BC Yes, exactly. And it's interesting you say 5 BC because we know that Jesus was not born in the year zero. It didn't exist. In fact, the whole Christian calendar that we use is out by five years because Dionysius Exiguus, the monk who developed the modern calendar in the year 525, missed out four years of the reign of Augustus. He missed out the year zero. And so if you just shift his calendar, we go back to 5 BC. And it turns out that in 5 BC, Chinese astronomers, Korean astronomers, did see a star in the east. It would have been visible in the dawn sky between the constellations of Capricornus and Aquila, the eagle. We know that the Chinese observed it for at least two and a half months. So it was probably something pretty bright. I'm just going to rehearse the story as Matthew tells it very briefly. They arrived in Bethlehem, the Magi. They'd seen a star in the east. They believed it marked the birth of the King of the Jews. And King Herod was completely unaware of all this. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, Herod wanted to know what they were doing because he was afraid that there might be a rival King of the Jews about to be born. So when they came to Bethlehem, Herod had asked them to come back and report to him. Instead, they worshipped the newborn babe. They offered him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And they departed and went home another way because they were suspicious of Herod's motives. And with that, they vanished into history. So, Steve, where did these people come from? The tradition says they were Zoroastrians, which was an ancient religion predating Judaism. Yeah, that's what the tradition says. In truth, nobody really knows. It's a matter of piecing together the historical evidence we have, that they were obviously fascinated with the stars, fascinated enough to travel hundreds or even a thousand miles to come and visit a baby or a king they'd never met. And there was in Persia a sect of priests called Magi or Magoi, who were Zoroastrians. And so again, those bits of fragmentary evidence fit together with the biblical account. A lot of Christian writers have thought that they might be Zoroastrians. An educated Jew called Philo described the Magi from Persia as being wise men who essentially were scientists. And indeed, linking it with the idea of kings, he suggested that you wouldn't become a king in Persia unless you were in the caste of the Magi. So there certainly is a connection with Zoroastrians. But I'm very interested in the research of Margaret Barker, who's linked the Magi with the 
ancient priests from Solomon's Temple, who, when they were banished in the 7th century BC, when Solomon's Temple was destroyed, they disappeared into the thickets of Arabia, as the Old Testament tells us. They were in the line of Melchizedek from Adam rather than the Levites. The thing about the Magi is the gifts that they bring, gold, frankincense and myrrh, which is in Matthew's Gospel, that really does resonate with Solomon's Temple because in Solomon's Temple, the altar of incense was made of pure gold. Frankincense was mixed with the incense when it was burned and myrrh was the anointing oil for the high priests when they went into the Holy of Holies. So, Mark, what was their particular skill? Were they astronomers? Were they astrologers? They would most definitely have been astrologers first and foremost. They would have taken a great interest in the sky. Their job would have been principally to look for signs in the sky and tell their masters, their rulers, what those signs meant. And we know that Chinese emperors employed court astrologers or astronomers who had the job of making absolutely sure that nothing happened in the sky without the ruler knowing This happened all around the civilised world. The Romans did it as well. They were extremely concerned with signs in the sky, signs on the earth that would help them to interpret events. So wherever they came from, they were probably not kings, but they were very highly regarded. They would have come from an intelligent strata of society. The fact that they were kings is something that appeared several centuries later. The early translations of the Bible just refer to them As wise men, astrologers is an alternative term that's been used. In fact, it wasn't until about the 6th century that the wise men, the magi, turned into kings. And the reasoning there is that the king of kings could not have been met by anybody less than a king himself. It was one of the ways that the early church made religion relevant to the people around them. Steve. Mark's right. What's interesting, of course, is that the idea of the wise men from the ends of the earth coming to visit the infant Jesus is no less significant theologically than the kings of the earth coming to visit him. The Bible says that everyone will bow down before the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore for these wise sages or philosophers to come and do so is entirely in keeping with what we'd expect. I I want to come to the significance of the story a little bit later. Now, these magi, Steve, dabbled in magic, which was something that the Old Testament sort of frowned upon. Well, yeah, they may have dabbled in all kinds of things. But what's clear is that they were led to Jerusalem and they could only have been led there by something unique to the people of Israel. And that, as far as I can see, can only have been their recognition of the Jewish scriptures and what they say about a star representing a king. Claire? Something that Philo, this educated Jew who died in 50 CE, who spoke about the true magic, the scientific vision by which the facts of nature are presented in a clearer light is a fit object of reverence and ambition and this was the true role of the magi so it's as if the word itself needed to be properly understood as something scientific not hocus pocus i want to come to the star and you're the expert in the star mark so tell me what your theory is of what this was that the magi saw in the night skies we know that the chinese observed something in the eastern sky in march or april of 5 bc this would have been visible before dawn We know that they saw it for 70 days. When it ceased to be visible, China was entering in monsoon season. So probably they would have got to a period of cloudy skies, very bad weather, when it would have been extremely difficult to follow an object in the sky. So it's possible that the star was actually visible for much longer. Now, the Chinese don't say anything about the star moving. The name for the star that they use is for a comet or a tailless comet, but they don't say it moved. The Chinese were very, very meticulous in describing the movement of comets. We can track Comet Halley over the ages through Chinese accounts, how it moved in the sky, the colour, the length of the tail, many, many details. They don't say this, so it's most likely that it was actually a very bright star. The simplest explanation for this star was that it was a nova, and what we call a new star, which is actually a very old star. It's two stars together. One is absorbing material from the other star, and this falls on the star progressively until there's a tremendous explosion on the star's surface. It may get a million times brighter 
for a few days, a few weeks, even a few months, and then fades back into insignificance. So for me, that's the most likely explanation of what the Chinese saw. And it's a very interesting coincidence that that would have appeared precisely at the right time. Claire. And I just love that theologically, because here we have something new out of something old, which is old in it, but is completely new. Christ as the morning star, which is um, very much within the tradition and the prophecies, being born in the east, which is just before dawn. And we say, you know, the darkest hour is before dawn. And then this new, very, very new thing happens, but with the old in it. I just love that when the physical characteristics something fit with something really theological and inspiring. It It does fit beautifully, but I can think of one small objection. You see, the star rose in the east. And the traditional image we have is that these people followed the star, but they couldn't have followed the star if it rose in the east, Steve. That's right. This is the Christmas card picture of these three wise men following the star through the desert. That's not what the historical documents that we have in Matthew's Gospel say. They say, we've seen the star at its rising or in the east, and therefore we've come to Jerusalem. They only followed it later when the star moved over Bethlehem. And that raises then the whole question of, well, how did they know to go to Jerusalem? There are many capitals in the ancient world in which a king could have been born. Why Jerusalem? And how did they know? The Old Testament Hebrew scriptures are replete with the symbolism of stars as kings. Stars in the Hebrew mind represent kings. Now, we know because the Israelite people were exiled to Babylon and later they encountered the Persians who set them free from their Babylonian exile, We know that the Babylonians and the Persians would have had contact with this Jewish tradition in their Old Testament scriptures. And these astrologers and astronomers would have been fascinated by this imagery of a star representing a king. So what could have been more natural than for these magi to have seen the arrival of a new light in the sky and concluded that a king had been born in Israel, the origin of these scriptures that they'd encountered? So they were not just astronomers or astrologers, they were also theologians. They were experts in a theology that was not their own, that had been imported to Babylon or Persia as a result of a Jewish exile, Claire. Unless, unless they were these ancient Merkava priests from Solomon's Temple from Arabia. The Hebrew word in the East can also mean from ancient times. Mikedem is the word, and it's the same word that's used for the planting of the Garden of Eden, translated in English into from the East, but it could be from ancient times. Mark, what do you make of this story of them following a star? We know the Zoroastrians had their messianic predictions. They believed in a messiah. They believed in the coming of a king. They believed in a virgin birth. So it's very nice. You think of an epic journey. They'd have crossed two major rivers, two mountain ranges, several deserts. It would have been several months journey. And if you have a star that was in the east at dawn, for example, at the start of April in 5 BC, Where would it have been after they had made an epic journey that may have taken them two months? At dawn, it would have been in the south. Where is Bethlehem? It is due south of Jerusalem. So by a very strange coincidence, the star would have been directly over Bethlehem as observed from Jerusalem. Now, if we go to Arabia, which is one of the other possibilities, suddenly things become very different because Arabia is a Fairly simple coastal voyage, disembark at the head of the Red Sea, up the King's Highway. Really, it turns into a journey that you would do in not more than a few days, a week at most. So certainly it takes an awful lot of the romance out of it. Well, and also the timing of the star and the timing of Herod's death works, doesn't it? Because it said that Jesus Jesus is born at the time of Herod. And Herod died, was it 4 BC? 4 BC, around about Easter. The... A phenomenon that keeps confronting us the more we discover about history, the more we discover about archaeology and, in Mark's case, about astronomy, that we find again and again and again the historical testimony of the Bible is corroborated by external evidence. Now, in some contexts, we express surprise about this. Why would we be surprised that the history texts of the Bible fit with what we are increasingly learning about the ancient world from other sources? Well, let me remind you that you're listening to Beyond Belief, and today we're discussing the Magi, the wise men who visited the infant Jesus following a star. Is that story true? How much of it can we trust? What does it mean for us today? And with me are Mark Kidger, an astronomer, Steve Jeffrey, an evangelical pastor, and Claire Foster Gilbert, who's a moral philosopher and theologian. 
Over Christmas, viewers to BBC One Television had an opportunity to see The Nativity. It was a four-part drama with a stellar cast, beautifully shot on location, and written by Tony Jordan, the former lead writer of EastEnders and the creator of such iconic TV shows as Hustle and Life on Mars. Earlier, I spoke to Tony Jordan. I asked him if his initial understanding of the Nativity story went beyond what he knew from school plays. I'm not particularly a man of faith, and I've done, I guess, what the majority of people do, which is go and see their kids in Nativity plays. Now, there are three strands to your particular version of the Nativity. There's the Mary Joseph strand, there's the Shepherd strand, and the one that we're interested in in this programme, the Magi. How did you come to understand who they were? Because you set them very definitely in Babylon. What people forget is that it was an oral tradition. Things were very rarely written down straight away, so stories were passed around from person to person. When I came to the Magi, there were so many different versions and so many different theories about who they were and where they were based and why they travelled to Bethlehem that I decided to just look at the heart of the story. And, and the best way forward that I could see was that they were a priestly order in in Babylonia, and they studied the stars, and they saw that something amazing was about to happen. Now, that's something amazing, according to your version, was a planetary conjunction, a link between Saturn, Jupiter, and another planet. Why did you hit on that solution? One of the theories is it was a conjunction between Jupiter, Saturn, and a star called Regulus. It's only one of probably a dozen different theories. What drew me to it was the conjunction of three heavenly bodies. I liked the thematic link of telling the story in three strands as as you've just said so that fitted for me and and it was as good as any of the other theories that I'd heard and you went for another trilogy three people three magi and you gave them names their traditional names but there's no mention of those names in the new testament did you do that as a narrative device it's a drama it's a television drama the characters need to have names they seem to be the most widely accepted names of Gaspar Melchior and Balthazar it was very unlikely that just three of these magi would have set out on such a journey on their own. They were quite important people and there would have been a caravan up to possibly a 100 people. And that changed the story that I told to some extent. You did change the narrative in one very obvious way in that they don't ever actually go to Jerusalem and they don't meet Herod. Yes. I had a real logic problem with knowing that Herod at that time was diseased and certainly paranoid and power crazed he would absolutely have been aware of the prophecy of the Jewish Messiah. If three magi came to him and said, the new king of the Jews is about to be born in Bethlehem, it occurred to me that a man like Herod would have them followed. The slaughter of the innocents would have taken place probably that night. I just didn't buy it. In your narrative, the magi arrive virtually at the moment of birth, very shortly afterwards, and the shepherds arrive at the same time. And the tradition seems to suggest that the wise men may have come a little while afterwards. Did you make them arrive together to sort of round it off nicely? I desperately wanted to end the piece on the iconic nativity scene. And then I wanted to finish with some of the words of the adult Christ over that image, just to remind people that this is kind of what's to follow. You started off this journey thinking this is just a nice story, but you've actually come to believe that there's truth in it. Yeah, I did. You know, again, it's kind of a weird one for me. It's a really strange journey. What happened that night was passed on by those shepherds to other shepherds, to other people for a hundred years. And a little bit like Chinese Whisper, some of the detail and some of the things that historians get hung up about are bound to be blurred over the course of time. So I came to believe when I'd finished and I was so moved by the story, I came to believe that I'd just written a true story. And it's now my belief that it kind of happened virtually as portrayed. That was Tony Jordan, the writer and executive producer of The Nativity. And I have to say that I loved it. But I wonder, Claire, what you made of his take on the story? Well, I ended up loving it too. I have to confess, when it started, could be such a cliche, you know, the nativity story. And I had memories of Life of Brian. and But the characters are rounded. You got drawn into the story. And, and this is the way I teach ethics now, is through storytelling. I was genuinely inspired by it and moved by it. I wept a little. He's told a true story and a great story. Some say the greatest story ever told. Now, Steve, the interesting thing about it was it seemed to me that his take on the story didn't vary all that much from what we've been talking about in the first half of this program. What's happening here is the same thing that many, many Christians have experienced. We start out trying to investigate Jesus Christ and we discover that he's got a hold of us and there's something compelling and attractive about him.
We are talking about the Magi, so let's concentrate on the bit of Tony's okay. story that concerns the Magi. And the one thing that I mentioned that he got, seems to me, completely wrong, according to the biblical account, was that, according to Tony, the Magi never went to Jerusalem. They never met with Herod. And the whole point about seeing the star in the east is that you see it from Jerusalem, if I've understood the signs correctly. So perhaps that's a problem. I still say, though, he's captured some essential truths about the story of the Magi. There are other ways you can tell that story. The other thing that seems out of kilter is the fact that the Magi would have arrived at the moment of the birth, when all the evidence is that it must have been sometime afterwards. The original text in Greek of the Bible that is used as the basis for all modern translations does not use the word for baby. It uses the word for what we'd call probably toddler, infant, somebody who was weeks, probably more like months old when the Magi arrived. Remember, if the Magi did come from Persia, it wasn't a journey they were going to make in a few days. You're talking about probably at least two months, maybe even three months between the planning, the execution and arriving. So it would be remarkable if they had managed to arrive exactly at the right moment. Steve? What's important is not to let the tradition overpower our assessment of the history. I also think there's something very important and profound here about journey and how, in a sense, the journey prepares you for this extraordinary moment of light, which we call the epiphany at the time of the Magi arriving, how that journey, in a way, prepared them for it. And again, this is how I teach ethics, how the things that are worth having, you have to work for, and they can take time, and there are dark times in the journey as well, but you keep going. You've got to think that nobody... 2,000 years ago, would have made a journey of 1,000 miles over rivers, mountains, deserts, with all the dangers involved, without having a very, very strong motivation. It was weeks, and it was a large part of your life to make that journey. In Tony's dramatisation, the Magi, and there are three of them, and we're not sure that there were three, but the Magi are given names. They're called Melchior, Gaspar, and Balthazar. Where did those names come from? Nobody really knows why those names were chosen. They were chosen back in the 6th century. And again, it's part of what inevitably builds up around a story like the account we have in Matthew's Gospel. They have been given other names in other traditions, and there are other depictions of them as well. Marco Polo talks about them being three different ages and that each one of them went in to see the Christ child in turn on their own. And the first one, who was a young man, saw the Christ child as a young man. The second one as a middle-aged man, and the third as an old man. I think that's a rather wonderful tradition about the ages of man within this tiny child. Another tradition has one of the Magi being African, one being Asian, and one being European, symbolising the whole world coming to kneel at embodied wisdom. I'm also intrigued by the fact that apparently their relics still exist in Cologne Cathedral. If you gathered together all the relics of the bones of Abraham, Moses, Jesus and the Magi, you would probably feel a fairly large skip. And it's true that Marco Polo saw tombs of the Magi in Persia after they'd been interred in Cologne. So it's about a century later. When he made his epic journey to Cathay, He passed through a town in northern Persia called Save, and there the people of the town assured him that the Magi had set off from that particular town. Steve? We keep raising the issue of symbolism, and this is worth thinking about, especially in relation to the gifts. Of course, the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh have played on the imagination of writers and poets and artists ever since the birth of Christ. There is only one place in the whole of the Bible, apart from the arrival of the Magi, when gold and frankincense and myrrh all appear together. And the scene is in the Song of Solomon, and it's in the arrival of King Solomon's carriage for his wedding. The carriage is decked out in gold, and it's perfumed with frankincense and myrrh. And then you have this startling image of 60 mighty men accompanying him. It's rather like if you showed up to your wedding with an entourage of men wearing dark glasses and carrying automatic weapons. It's very peculiar. He's coming with an armed guard. And you think, why would this king be presented in this way? The answer is, in Solomon's case, he's anticipating having to fight for his bride. He's anticipating having to defend her. 
And you wonder how much of that imagery are we supposed to see in Christ? He is one who will not just give his life for his people, for his bride, but fight for her. More traditionally, I was always taught gold was for kingship, frankincense was for priesthood, myrrh was for burial. Burial and or healing, both those are in the tradition. That's right. Imagine the resonance this is intended to have. Jesus, having been given myrrh at his birth, is anointed with myrrh after his death and before his burial. And so we see here in this the joyous scene of the birth of a baby, this eerie premonition of his coming death. Maybe we're supposed to think that's what he's come for. As we bring this programme to end, I just want to ask each one of you a final question. What, Claire, for you makes this story still relevant today? Gosh, it speaks to me very profoundly, actually. I love the concept of, and frankly, the experience of epiphany, the sense of this concentrated light and wisdom in the, this vulnerable Christ child and the greatness of the earth, however we want to characterize it in the Magi, and the humblest of the earth and the shepherds coming to this tiny place of concentrated light. And somehow that opening out of that light, that making available of that light to the ends of the earth and beyond, and the experience that one has, and we call it epiphany, at the ah moment when you suddenly realise something, suddenly understand something, suddenly see something differently. And I love that word orient from that point of view. We three kings of orient are, we sing. They orient us. They show us the right way to look. It's really that profound re-looking that speaks most to me in this story. Mark, what for you makes the story still relevant today? It's the greatest scientific mystery of them all. And it doesn't matter if you're a scientist like me, and I'm not a believer. I suppose I class myself as an agnostic. But for me, it's a fascinating story. It's a fascinating mystery. But if you're a religious person, if you're a profound believer, you can also find very interesting the fact that there may well have been a star. Steve? This story encapsulates the gospel in a nutshell. What we've got here is Jesus announced as the king of all the world, the magi who lay down everything. They go on the journey of a lifetime and they find what they've been looking for. That, for me, is what all of us are invited to do, to come to Jesus Christ and find what we're looking for, what the scriptures say about him. Well, there we must leave it. For all its difficulties, the story of the Magi still resonates across the ages. My thanks to Claire Foster Gilbert, Steve Jeffrey and Mark Kidger. I'll be back again at the same time next week when I hope you'll join me.